Well, we didn't like that in the United States. So in 2002, a coup was staged, which is no question in my mind, in most other people's minds, that the CIA was behind that coup. The way that that coup was fomented was very reflective of what Kermit Roosevelt had done in Iran, of, of paying people to go out into the streets to riot, to protest, to say this Chavez is very unpopular. You know, you, if you can get a few thousand people to do that you, you get television, and can make it look like it's the whole country, and things start to mushroom. Except in the case of Chavez, he was smart enough, and the people were so strongly behind him that they overcame it, which was a phenomenal moment in the history of Latin America. Iraq actually is a perfect example of the way the whole system works. So we economic hitmen are the first line of defense. We go in and we try to corrupt the governments and, and get them to accept these huge loans, which we then use as leverage to basically own them. If we fail, as I failed in, in Panama with Omar Torrijos and in Ecuador with Jaime Roldos, men who refuse to be corrupted, then the second line of defense is we send in the jackals. And the jackals either overthrow governments or they assassinate. And once that happens and a new government comes in, and boy, it's going to toe the line because the new president knows what will happen if he doesn't. In the case of Iraq, uh, both of those things failed. Economic hitmen were not able to get through to Saddam Hussein. We tried very hard. We tried to get him to accept a deal very similar to what the House of Saud had accepted in Saudi Arabia, but he wouldn't accept it. And so the jackals went in to take him out. They couldn't do it. His security was very good. Um, after all, he had one time worked for the CIA. He'd been hired to assassinate a former president of, of, of Iraq and failed, but he knew the system. So in 91, we send in the troops and we take out the Iraqi military. So we assume at that point that Saddam Hussein is going to come around. We could have taken him out, of course, at that time, but we didn't want to. He's the kind of strong man we like. He controls his people. He could, you know, we thought he could control the Kurds and keep the Iranians in their border and keep pumping oil for us. And then once we took out his military, now he's going to come around. So the economic hitmen go back in in the 90s without success. If they'd had success, he'd still be running the country. We'd be selling him all the fighter jets he wants and everything else he wants. But they couldn't. They, they, they didn't have success. The jackals couldn't take him out again. So we sent the military in once again, and this time we did the complete job and took him out and in the process created for ourselves some very, very lucrative construction uh, deals. We had to reconstruct a country that we essentially destroyed, which is a pretty good deal if you own construction companies, big ones. So, you know, Iraq shows the three stages. The economic hitmen failed there, the jackals failed there, and as a final measure, the military goes in. And in that way, we've really created an empire, but we've done it very, very subtly. It's clandestine. All the empires of the past were built on the military, and everybody knew they were building them. So the, the British knew they were building them, the French, the Germans, the, the Romans, the, the Greeks, and they were proud of it. And they always had some excuse like spreading civilization, spreading some religion, something like that, but they, they knew they were doing it. We don't. The majority of the people in the United States have no idea that we're living off the benefits of a clandestine empire, that today there's more slavery in the world than ever before. And then you have to ask yourself, well, if it's, if it's an empire, then who's the emperor? Obviously, our presidents of the United States are not emperors. An emperor is someone who's not elected, doesn't serve a limited term, and doesn't report to anyone, essentially. So you can't classify our presidents that way. But we do have what I consider to be the equivalent of the emperor, and it's what I call the corporatocracy. The corporatocracy is this group of individuals who run our biggest corporations, and they really act as the emperor of this empire. Um, they control our media, either through direct ownership or advertising. They control most of our uh, politicians because they finance their campaigns, either through their corporations or through personal contributions that come out of the corporations. They're not elected, they don't serve a limited term, they don't report to anybody. And at the very top of the corporatocracy, you really can't tell whether a person's working for a private corporation or the government because they're always moving back and forth. 
So, you know, you've got a guy who one moment is the president of, uh, of a big construction company like Halliburton, and, and, and the next moment he's vice president of the United States, or the president who was in the oil business. And, and this is true whether you've got Democrats or Republicans in the office. You have the moving back and forth through the revolving door. And in a way, um, our government is, is invisible a lot of the time, and its policies are carried out by our corporations on one level or another. And then again, the policies of the government are basically forged by the corporatocracy and then presented to the government, they become government policy. So it's an incredibly cozy relationship. This isn't a conspiracy theory type of thing. These people don't have to get together and, and plot to do things. They all basically work under one primary assumption, and that is that they must maximize profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. This process of manipulation by the corporatocracy through the use of debt, bribery, and political overthrow is called globalization. Just as the Federal Reserve keeps the American public in a position of indentured servitude through perpetual debt, inflation, and interest, the World Bank and IMF serve this role on a global scale. The basic scam is simple. Put a country in debt, either by its own indiscretion or through corrupting the leader of that country, then impose conditionalities or structural adjustment policies, often consisting of the following. Currency devaluation. When the value of a currency drops, so does everything valued in it. This makes indigenous resources available to predator countries at a fraction of their worth. Large funding cuts for social programs. These usually include education and healthcare, compromising the well-being and integrity of the society, leaving the public vulnerable to exploitation. Privatization of state-owned enterprises. This means that socially important systems can be purchased and regulated by foreign corporations for profit. For example, in 1999, the World Bank insisted that the Bolivian government sell the public water system of its third largest city to a subsidy of the U.S. corporation Bechtel. As soon as this occurred, water bills for the already impoverished local residents skyrocketed. It wasn't until after a full-blown revolt by the people that the Bechtel contract was nullified. Then there is trade liberalization, or the opening up of the economy through removing any restrictions on foreign trade. This allows for a number of abusive economic manifestations, such as transnational corporations bringing in their own mass-produced products, undercutting the indigenous production and ruining local economies. An example is Jamaica which, after accepting loans and conditionalities from the World Bank, lost its largest cash crop markets due to competition with Western imports. Today, countless farmers are out of work, for they are unable to compete with the large corporations. Another variation is the creation of numerous, seemingly unnoticed, unregulated, inhumane sweatshop factories, which take advantage of the imposed economic hardship. Additionally, due to production deregulation, environmental destruction is perpetual as a country's resources are often exploited by the indifferent corporations while outputting large amounts of deliberate pollution. The largest environmental lawsuit in the history of the world today is being brought on behalf of 30,000 Ecuadorian Amazonian people against Texaco, which is now owned by Chevron. So today it's against Chevron, but for activities conducted by Texaco, estimated to be more than 18 times what the Exxon Valdez dumped into the coast of Alaska. In the case of Ecuador, it wasn't an accident. The oil companies did it intentionally. They knew they were doing it to save money out there rather than, rather than arranging for a proper disposal. Furthermore, a cursory glance at the performance record of the World Bank reveals that the institution, which publicly claims to help poor countries develop and alleviate poverty, has done nothing but increase poverty and the wealth gap, while corporate profits soar.